Hi, good afternoon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nasher Sculpture Center. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today it's my honor to introduce artist Samara Golden. The lower level gallery of the Nasher has seen a lot over the years. It's been filled with balloons, landscaped and spray painted, and strung with barbed wire, luckily not at the same time as the balloons. But this is the first time an artist has fundamentally reshaped the space, or at least our perception of it transforming it into a lagoon by turns alluring and repellent that extends beyond the physical boundaries of the room. Samara Golden, the quiet force behind this transformation, has had solo exhibitions at MoMA PS1, the Fabric Workshop and Museum Philadelphia, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Night Gallery Los Angeles, and Canada, New York. Her monumental installation, The Meat Grinder's Iron Clothes, was on view in the 2017 Whitney Biennial. She has participated in group shows at Stadtliche Kunsthalle Baden-Baden, Germany, Tanya Bonaktar Gallery, Nicel Boschen, New York, and Youth Museum, Shanghai. Golden was featured in the 2014 Made in LA Biennial and in Room to Live at MoCA Los Angeles. In 2015, a monograph on Golden was published by MoMA PS1, and her work has been written about in publications including Art Forum, Art in America, The New York Times, the New Yorker and Moose Magazine. Golden's work is in the collections of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Whitney Museum of American Art, LACMA, MOCA Los Angeles, Orange County Museum of Art, Zabludovich Collection in London, and Use Museum Shanghai. In conversation with Golden is Nasher cu Senior Curator, Na Ka excuse me, Nasher Senior Curator Catherine Kraft, who has been with the Nasher since 2011. Kraft is the author of An Audience of Artists, Dada, Neo Dada, and the Emergence of Abstract Art, and Robert Rauschenberg, as well as numerous articles and reviews. At the Nasher, Kraft has most recently curated the Dallas presentation of Thaddeus Mosley Forrest and Nairi Bagramian Model Vivant. I know that artist and curator have been working closely together for the past few weeks to bring this exhibition to fruition, and I'm looking forward to a thoughtful reflection, so to speak, on that process. Please join me now in welcoming Samara Golden and Catherine Kraft. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out, first of all. Um, and Anna, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I'm going to start, I'm afraid, by taking a drink and then we will uh, get underway. <clears throat> Samara, we've been here, uh, we've spent a lot of time in the lower level of the Nasher for the last uh, three weeks, I think. And um, as Anna was saying, this is one, really the first time an artist has transformed that space so fully, um, we've been talking about this exhibition for quite a while, um, and you made a number of the components for it uh, in your Los Angeles studio, but you really were kind of putting them together um, here. Uh, so I also wanted to just kind of start with the idea that you've really composed this work on site, and um, you, and for that matter, I are still kind of settling into and getting used to the fact that it's finished. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, what has it been like, or do you feel like you've been able to spend enough time in it since you're no longer working on it? No. <laughs> <laughs> we finished it two days ago in the afternoon. Yeah. And um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, actually, when I first got here, this whole room was full of, coated with plastic and I had all my stuff everywhere and we were trying to put together all the water pieces. So it's kind of funny to be back here in this <laughs> <laughs> situation. Um, yeah, I really didn't know if anything was going to work and so <laughs> it was, it's been a process of figuring out things all the way along the way until this pretty much this moment. So I haven't really gotten that much time to spend with the piece in its final iteration. 
Um, yeah, yeah. And, and um, you're seeing, I mean, we've just kind of set them on a carousel, um, images of some of Samara's previous installations. And one of the things that you see is that, um, you know, for a number of years, she's used mirrors in her works to create spaces that are, um, I think you use the term impossible spaces, like spaces that you're seeing, but they somehow shouldn't be able to exist. Um, and one of the things that was really kind of astonishing to me um, when we were installing the show is, and of course, um, there was, uh, we had a team of at first four and then two art handlers, and Smar was directing them how to put things, attach things um, to the ceiling. And as um, a curator who has to install things as well, um, I know that it can sometimes be very difficult to verbalize, you know, where you wish you could just pick up and move a hundred pound sculpture. If you could just do it yourself, you could put it in the right place. Um, and you're trying to tell somebody like, no, two inches here, four inches back. Um, but I was watching you trying to um, think backwards and upside down because you're attaching sculptures to the ceiling. And how did, I mean, do you recall how that started or how you figured out how to achieve what you wanted, not just with this piece, but earlier on? Um, Still figuring it out, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a really confusing process just to talk about that actual situation Catherine's speaking of. It's sort of like you have to be able to tell somebody that well, I should say that the mirrors that were on the floor in the piece weren't up, well, they weren't installed until near to the end. So I just had a mirror on a dolly, a large mirror, and we were moving it around to try to test to see what things would look like in the end. So yeah, it's very, it's hard, because first you have to decide, am I speaking in illusionistic language or am I speaking in the reality, the real, like when you say, up higher, down lower, is that in the, in, in the reflection or in the um, real life? So part of it is coming up with a language that everyone understands and then sticking with it, which none of us did. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also I was really composing it like a painting. But I had, things are always a little backwards also with the way I needed to install it because the water, or the water surface is what I call it, the plastic, that had to be installed first so that I could test it with the fans and make sure the currents and that it actually was working. Because in my studio, I could only test eight feet by eight feet because it's, I didn't have enough space. So that had to be installed first, which creates all these vertical wire lines, um, the way it's hung. So then all the sculptures not only have to be hung up there in between those, but if you want to move them clockwise or down or anything, you have to T take it out and go, it's just, I really thank the art handlers for being so patient with me because it wasn't easy for any of us and, and they're up on the ladders most of the time, so, but I was up there too. <laughs> and um, I'll say one thing that's interesting that you guys don't get to experience, but being on a ladder inside the piece with the mirrors up, <laughs> like on top of the mirrors, we put foam and plywood and then a ladder. It's like if you're at the top of the ladder, it actually looks like it's 30 feet down to because so the illusion is really scary to be up there. So um, yeah, I don't know if that gets to what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, and I mean, just to back up a little bit, I mean, the way physically the, the piece started was Samara drew up plans um, for us to prepare the space. And so what when you go into the lower level gallery, and I'm just curious, how many of you have already had a look at the show before coming? Okay, most of you have, that's great. Um, you know, she started by sending us plans to build basically a sort of wedge or, or pie-shaped room, uh, like a slice of pie, um, that then got, um, like, as she was saying, covered with mirrors on the walls and um, on the floor. And so I think that kind of, I think comparing it to a painting 
is really interesting because on the one hand, you do have like you have the sculptures and other materials suspended from the ceiling. You have the waves of water just below that. And then um, there are the fans and the lights that really finish the piece. I mean, they're like their own composition. Yeah. Um, and they create effects that I think even you didn't necessarily expect. Um, you want me to talk about the raindrops? Yeah, that was, that was really special. Okay, but interject if I'm not. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So part of it is that I can't actually see the piece in, before it's made. And then part of it is that I really believe, I guess kind of in a superstitious way, about the piece um, becoming itself in this way that I can't figure out, which is pretty terrifying as a, like you're almost done and then you just don't know if anything's gonna work and come together in the way that you want. But one really nice thing is that we were working really close together the last three days of the install and Catherine and I were trying to light the piece, um, which is such a big deal um, for just like, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what we saw in there from being in there for a while is those raindrops that appear around the perimeter of the circle, which may, you may or not, not see or you might, but they are not raindrops and they are just an illusion and they are something that's like, I couldn't have known how to create that. And so in terms of manipulating all the really crappy materials <laughs> to make an illusion, um, that was such a nice surprise and it was really special because after a while for me, and I don't wanna have what I see in it necessarily have to be what anyone else sees, but I felt like it was sort of a, you know, the feeling that when you have and it's a stormy night and there's drizzle and I don't get any of that in LA because it never, it hardly ever rains. <laughs> and I really love that emotional kind of, like kind of, feeling of just being able to look at something and relax, I guess, which is sort of like what the ocean or a fireplace um, is sort of like. So, but back to the lighting, one, one thing is then the next day, we found out, or it was long story, but that we could use spotlights in the piece. So I replaced all the lights and pointed them differently. And it was like also another epiphany kind of, because mm -hmm. there was a, an ability to light the edges so that the whole perimeter, so that you could see under really far away. And then there are a lot of things like, there's no way I could have planned it. Like, I'm not that smart, you know? <laughs> it was just things that started to happen. And that's what the part of the piece, or the part of the process that I really love. And it was nice to share it. And it was exciting and exhausting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the whole thing is really like this, I think you said, but this is a totally new work for me. Like, maybe a similar format I've used with mirrors a little bit, but it's, I was trying to achieve a completely different thing. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I think one of the things that is really new in her, um, in your, in your work um, with this piece is, as you've seen with some of the works going by in the carousel, a lot of times you're, um, your installations are responding to um, architecture or kind of pre-existing features in a building and they will often be like different floors or they'll have some kind of geometric basis or, or um, levels of things. And this is really like, um, even though we're in a very, you know, sort of architecturally significant building, I think even before I think you got to kind of the, the themes and ideas of the piece specifically, we were already talking about going down the stairs here and the descending kind of underground as it, as it were. And into this space, which as Anna referenced, has, you know, it has a, a, this kind of white cube gallery feeling. It doesn't have the same kind of architectural character necessarily that you, that you find, say, upstairs, for example. Um, and so I think it really did kind of leave open 
the possibilities of trying something completely different. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, we've been, you know, we've talked a little bit about the how, and we'll come back, I think, continually to that. But um, I think I think the idea of thinking about water came pretty pretty early in the in the process. Yes. Yeah. Um, just well, I don't know what it is actually, but I I I've just been very drawn to try to create water, and I actually haven't really. I made a jacuzzi in the Whitney um, one, which was like the most fun part of the whole, like, you know, cause the part of it is I really love making, when it comes up, I'll point to it really fast and you can see. <laughs> but um, I really love making all the objects. I really make everything myself mostly. Um, and I I love the idea of like, it's. I guess it's a bit of trompe l'oeil and a bit of lighting, and a, it's a little theatrical, but um, but I hadn't tried it again. But also, I feel like water has come up in a lot of my work because I'm like trying to look for that one piece, <laughs> um, just because I think it represents like the fantasy of being on vacation or release or relief, or like this idea of this blue ocean that all of us have in our mind as this vacation. Um, or this, like I think you said yesterday, like this idea that after this installation is over, like, oh, wouldn't it be great to go to a blue ocean, clear mm -hmm. place, and it's warm water, and it's so amazing and stuff. So there's that fantasy, but then there's also mm -hmm. the swill of like nuclear waste water, and all the, mm -hmm. I've been listening to a lot of crime stuff, which is really weird, because I don't know why I've been doing it, but. Do you mean like true crime? True crime, like yeah. Podcast stuff. stuff and yeah. Which mm -hmm. someone actually, one of the art handlers, like really astutely said that women like to listen to it more for the fact that it just they want to be, they want to learn from it and to be prepared, which I thought was really interesting. But so anyway, there's all the like all through history and through films and books and everything. There's always like a woman at the bottom of the river with like who's been killed. <laughs> And her hair is like this, and it's also mm -hmm. this weird, demented, romantic, like, vision, which I am totally against. But I, <laughs> but I like, I was trying to create some sort of balance between the nuclear swill and the, um, like, beautiful, like, scuba or snorkel weather that you can have in a perfect situation, knowing that both are... I don't know. I guess mostly it's really personal. And that's why it's mm -hmm. also hard for me to talk about the piece right now because it just finished it. But I don't know that's something about water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's also, though, that, um, and we've talked about this a little bit, that, you know, personal thoughts about water, but water is also just it's such an elemental force and such a major and important part of all of our lives that I think we all have different, we all bring our own personal sort of connections to water that have um, more in common than they don't, you know, yeah. but they can still be very specific things. I mean, we just talked to somebody this morning who said they found the piece very peaceful and I've talked to somebody else who said they've, you know, they found elements of the work rather disturbing. And I think both those things can be true. Um, I think one of the things that's very, that's somewhat unexpected is um, the, the way different elements appear as you're looking and as you're moving across, like from one edge of the platform to another. Um, and this is a work that, it's funny, there is this element of just wanting to stare out at it as you're looking at a fire in a fireplace or, or looking out at a, a, a lake or the ocean. But there's also an element of, um, it is kind of sculptural in that if you move along um, the railing, you'll see different parts of it. Um, and in part, that's owed to the materials you're using. Yeah. These incredible reflective fabrics 
and diachromatic, which I forgot to, or yeah, diachromatic. Diachromatic. It's, which means that there's some material in there that changes color dependent on the perspective and the light, um, which in an almost impossible way to figure out. So there was really a lot of happy moments in the, um, mm -hmm. in the piece seeing through, and I don't want to say that this is there, but what I saw is that it, in some faraway areas there's like a small flame underneath the water and then there's like this, um, it goes from purple to green to yellow and it's sort of like very far away and then there's black um, silhouettes and f that you can't understand and that's due to a combination of the reflective material that's actually on the top of, or yeah, on the, in real life on the top of the installation which kind of makes a halo effect when you have a light pointed directly at it and also the di, I think it's called diachromatic, some people call it holographic but it's not correct, um, material that changes uh, the color depending on the not only your perspective but the light on it so it's kind of like you, to wrangle all that stuff uh, together to create this thing it's almost like this impossible puzzle so I don't think like I couldn't have really tried to do that unless I had a year inside of the piece um, making so it's not, those surprises are really that's mm -hmm. what I was hoping yeah. for yeah you know in a in addition, I mean, to those, those fabrics are, you know, they may be unusual to see in artworks, but they're not, they're, they're common in like what, construction or how did you come across these types of fabrics? Well, actually the reflective um, fabric I'm talking about is um, made with glass beads, which is similar to the way that they do the um, reflectors like on stop signs or on the road on the highway. Um, but they're smaller glass beads and it's kind of a newer technology because now you can, you know, if you look on eBay or what, what, no, whatever, Amazon, you can find a sweatshirt made of this stuff. I think some people call it flash material because if you have headlights on it in a very dark place, it learn, turns bright white. But in this case, the light is more medium and so I'm mostly using it as a highlight. And then we had to make some decisions about the lighting that were hard. Um, but one was that there was a bigger halo around a different kind of light. And now the light's more precise, so there's less of a halo. But the color comes out, and I don't know, it's, you have to look hard or for a long time. <laughs> now, I, I guess, um, you know, it was, it was interesting, I think the, the what this fabric is, you know, where it comes from to, and how it's typically used. I mean, it, it kind of also speaks to a way that you've worked all along. I mean, you were saying that, you know, your components, the, the sculptures are all handmade and they're made at a smaller scale. Um, you know, you'll see beach chairs um, in this installation, you know, that in reality may be about that high. Um, but one of the things that I think is also interesting about it is really all the materials you use are pretty common. They're construction materials. Um, I'm seeing flat side of the knife, which some of your, some of your um, sorry, uh, installations use as a Thermax. Yeah, Thermax. Which, yeah, which is a common insulation material. Yeah. And the sculptural, fig, all the sculptures, the figures, and the sea life, um, how, are, how are those made? Spray foam, like insulation spray foam. I don't know, I don't know if it's a political thing or a class thing, but I just really like using materials that I can get as a, they're not really artist materials. I found ways to make them more archival, but I feel like, um, I like the idea that anyone can make a piece like this and anybody can make, um, have a connection to it, you know, like kids can have a connection to it, um, but not because it's a trick, but because it's a, I don't really know what to call it, more, I guess, I used to use the word populist, but now I don't know if that's the right word, because that's been 
weaponized <laughs> more in a political way. But um, that's been important. And also, or wait, I think, I don't know. Yeah, sure go, also, about. yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess in the bigger picture, what I'm trying to do is make something that can't re really be made on Earth. And with, like, in a sense that with gravity, with the way the all the laws of the world work, you can't do the thing I want to do. And so I like the fact, I don't like mirrors particularly, or not interested in making illusionistic tricks, but I like the fact that they can carve out a space that you can never inhab inhabit in real life, but you could also feel like is really there. I, I'm not really, it's very hard to describe it, but so that's where I'm headed, and I know like every piece to me fails really badly at it, but I feel that that's the only way that I have a chance to make what I want to make. Um, I don't know if I said that very well. Yeah, that, no, I think that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, do you, do you think if you could make a piece that didn't fail, would it be, would it be perfect or would it, do you think it would be satisfied? I mean, yeah, well, we've talked about this a lot because I struggled, like, it's embarrassing kind of, but the whole thing is like, I've, I've been working every second and totally stressed, you know? And I don't want to be like that as a person. Um, but at the same time, I think that struggle, I guess it's kind of necessary for the thing to come out the way it is. And the fact that you, the illusion is broken is sort of important to the way it comes out. And that it's like, if I had everyone fabricate every part of it and I worked with 3D designers and computer graphics or <laughs> that sounds really old but you know what I mean like and was somehow able to make this thing and it came out how it was supposed to come out I don't think it would be right for me that's no comment on anyone else's process though but also I think like for instance I thought about what if I could make a piece on this space station or what if I got to design the whole space station so there was no gravity as a um, limitation um, I have no idea, you know, I don't know. I, a lot of people, I think, moved to cinema to try to deal with this problem, actually. Because, mm -hmm. like, for instance, in 2001, which was, I feel silly bringing it up, but everyone knows that scene where the, I think, are they jogging around the whole wheel? And so every, every scene, every part is just where you are, and that's your gravity, and then there, it goes around. Like, you just have to watch the scene. But I feel like a lot of film, or like there's film tricks that are widely employed, like people that are on a wall that's actually on the floor, but the camera is above, and then they're pretending like they're falling down. But um, anyway, I think it's easy to go, or not easy. It's, I think most people trying to do what I wanted to do might think that they could do it better in film. So. It's that kind of red herring you haven't heard about yet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, that's that's fine. What else? Yeah, I'm think I'm also thinking about. Um, I don't know. I I keep coming back to water, and it's interesting to me. Like when I was putting together the slides, reminding myself that uh, water also shows up in some of your very earliest installations as as video or as oh, yeah. still, is it video or still image in the? Video, but it's yeah. important in that, oh, we just passed it. The Rape of the Mirror one, which was in 2011, that footage of the breaking waves was behind the, there it is. Mm -hmm. But that's actually video up there. Um, but that was very important that it was actually a day when I went very sad over a lot of things to the ocean and just, it was like my eyes looking at the ocean, and it's the real video, even though it wasn't the best quality video. I didn't go back to reshoot it. It's really what it was, and that's been really important to me, that it's, it's kind of like a witchy um, kind of, it's probably not the right way to say it, but I just feel things have to be sincere in order to build up any momentum with anybody else. 
or to make some kind of, like it has to mean something to me in order for it to mean anything to anybody else. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that's, and that in that case, the water was, it's like it is that, I don't know, like when you're the saddest you could ever be, you, if you go to the water and just look out, it feels like, I don't know that it heals you, but it just mm -hmm. feels like maybe that's the only thing you can possibly do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of universal. I'm not sure, but but at the same time, I'm terrified of like I'm not I can't swim in the ocean very well because I'm not I can't deal with the rip tides and I've gotten pummeled so many times and but also so the other what was the other one that was water that I was supposed to think about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, mass murder also has the, oh, yeah. the bedroom the next the next one in the carousel. Yes, yeah. one, but. This one is, well, actually, this is a nice example of how I didn't, so this is another piece where I just didn't know how it would really work or look in the end. And those kind of sunsets and space that was created behind all this furniture in this blue living room was a kind of surprise for me. It's really a projection on the back wall, but it was supposed mm -hmm. to be like this installation. You walk through several rooms, mm -hmm. and I thought of it all as a brain that you're walking through different thoughts. But the part that was a sunset projected was a different thought. But then it ended up creating more space, and so it create in the reflections of this room. So it made it was like a surprise where this room became expanded and was this huge, like fancy, um, like kind of aspirational, mm -hmm. um, like place that like, it was actually sort of about my grandparents' house, <laughs> <laughs> but at the, in Arizona that would, had like white carpet, I don't even know this is blue, but, and a piano and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then the other spaces were more harsh and um, more like about terrible things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> and cigarettes and booze and stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things that strikes me also from, you know, these works and also right down to um, um, the present installation, um, you often have, I, I think sometimes, you know, you've, you've told me you're not always so comfortable talking about your work, but you have really beautiful poetic titles. Um, and this current one, um, if Earth is the brain, then where is the body? Is really, I'm, I'm put in mind to think of it again because you were describing this installation as like walk, the, this uh, mass murder is walking through different spaces that are like different parts of a brain. And also with upstairs at Steve's, if it's possible to go to that, that that's also there, I guess I'm thinking there is there is sometimes in the work a kind of split between, you know, earth, uh, body and brain, or between what we see in our minds and what we end up with in reality. And I'm just wondering, am I right in thinking that's that seems to be a kind of through line? In, Good question. In your, in your, in your, <laughs> I know. I was like, um, it's not a question I've, I've sprung on you before. I'm just, it just occurred to me, and it may, it may help people. It may, it may help for um, people who don't know upstairs at Steve's, like what, who Steve is, and what that refers referred to. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, the title for upstairs at Steve's is more direct than any of my other titles, but my. Uh, uh, brother-in-law um, died of ALS like a cup, I don't know. 20, 2019, 20, yeah. 20, this piece yeah. was 2020. So, right, yeah. I can't even keep track of time because of the pandemic and stuff. But um, he died of ALS like young and it was just a horrible situation. It's just such an unfair thing. And um, so this piece that this one is, it was sort of like, a hurricane hit, and this is similar actually in form to this piece in that it's a pie-shaped space, but um, and everything you're seeing is installed on the ceiling. But it was kind of like the what's after a storm, sort of in a way, and then there was a building in the middle. But um, let's 
see how to talk. Well, there was something you were touching on that I, about the titles mm -hmm. that I was. Should I talk about the title of this one for a sec? I don't know. Yeah, uh, if if yeah, I don't go know ahead. if that's skipping around too much, but no. Um, let's see. Well, I feel like I've been trying to work in an abstraction in a way a lot more. Um, I don't think it's the right word, abstraction, but instead of having things have their logic, like there's the structure that's the mirrors and the physical structure, which is kind of like, I feel like the, like a stretcher in a painting. It's only the beginning. And then there's the structure, like at the Whitney, I've built with platforms, and then you see under them and above them in the reflections, and they go down, and then that piece was more about class, and um, it was more about the stratification of different ways of being in the world. But I really have been interested in trying to do something that's more well, all of them have had some emotion, but almost something that I can't really say what it is. And so that's why it's super uncomfortable to talk about it right now, is because it usually takes a while for me to even figure it out. But with the name of this one, I felt like I just heard that in my ear, which is unusual. Like usually I have the huge lists of words, and I'm trying to find the title by a million thesaurus. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like a little, mm -hmm. I have a pocket thesaurus and just trying to figure it out. But with this one, I really like the way that, can you say it again? I'm really bad at saying the title. <laughs> but yeah, if earth is the brain, then where is the body? Yes. <laughs> um, I like the way that I couldn't understand or even really conceptualize what that, that meant. Like, I just had to sit there thinking, like, I, I can barely stretch my brain to understand what that means. And then I really like the idea that this piece is parallel or mimicking that idea, but in a really different way. And so to me, I was happy for that moment of harmony uh, with, between mm -hmm. two unknowable things, kind of. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think there's just something, I really love making stuff so much, and I feel like some of the logistical math that I've put into the puzzle and other pieces was really necessary in order to get to here. But I feel interested in trying to make, like I, somebody said, who's in here, but I can't see her, but mm -hmm. said that the piece made her feel peaceful, which is something that I didn't, I had no idea what would happen, but I like the idea that being there, or like when we saw the raindrops, Mm -hmm. I felt like a sense of relief that it was somewhere, it was something, and it was actually becoming its own thing. Yeah. And, um, and that it could be, maybe do mm -hmm. something similar to those other things in life that really do that, like fires or ocean sides, or, but without being a manipulative, like mm -hmm. dramatic stage set where you just need to add some cracking lightning and some like special flashing lights that do ex where you're just trying to manipulate everything. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that makes any sense. Just, it makes sense to me. I, <laughs> and I, I guess what I was thinking of and what I like about um, the title and kind of the way the piece works is, um, I mean, I don't want to belabor it too much, but like when I think of upstairs at Steve's, which is also um, we talked about this one of the first times we yeah. were talking together that I have a nephew who also um, died of ALS um, not so long ago. And in both cases, I mean, it is, it's a horrible disease, but one thing that happens, and it happened to um, both the people in our family, is that you know, the, the mind remains perfectly intact and you lose all ability to like communi you can all all ability to speak and communicate, and so it's kind of like being it's a, it's, it's like being trapped. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, and it's also this kind of like separation between body and mind. And I think one of the things that's in in my head that this title of the Nasher piece does is that it puts this I don't know kind of a third term in there. Nice. Like, if Earth is the brain, then where is the body? And it's like, well, shouldn't the body be here too? I mean, we usually want to connect Earth and body, even though there's like, um, 
I think more recently people talk about Earth as, you know, like that trees communicate with each other and there's all these different uh -huh. systems. Oh, that's interesting. I, t I took it differently. Uh, I love you, that. Tell me, tell me how you took it, though. I took it more like Earth, the Earth. And so I was thinking about it. Well, I love the idea of having the poem within a poem within a poem within a mm -hmm. poem. And I love the idea of having a macro thing happening at the same time as a micro thing, or I, just like mm -hmm. the big picture. And also inside of it are millions of details, which are the little pictures, and having them in conversation with each other. But so I was thinking of it as like the universe, like is, like it's really bigger than I can understand, but that the universe is asking, or the, the mm -hmm. where is the body is like, it's, I can't really explain it, but you can have your own association to the title, but I just felt like it was bigger than I could imagine. And I thought of it as being like galactical, like really far out. Mm -hmm. And then I just felt it was, fitting because also there's this weird, I mean, this might be stretching it a little bit. I have been interested in the fact that the ocean is like actually less explored and we know less about it supposedly, according to scientists, than we do about space at this point, about the actual stars and like what's out there in terms of physical atmospheres and gases and stuff. We are really blind about what's on earth and that I think that that's a really, I don't know, I guess I have a, there's a lot of stuff in there that I don't talk about. I don't know. But I think that's, I don't know, there, there's, I think that's one of the, the things, I know you still have a lot of questions about the piece yourself, um, to yourself and, and generally, but I think something that can bear that much meaning even if they're contradictory meanings. And, and not just, I don't mean meaning just intellectually, but like emotions and um, associations is, it makes, it makes for a really rich work. That's nice. I mean, that's good. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's, that's what I, I mean, I think um, you've talked sometimes about your work being um, You've used the word invocations, or trying to bring, draw, or bring things together, or yeah, some, or some, what is the word? In, uh, summoning. A summoning. <laughs> yeah. Summoning, or like convocation. Yeah, well, I think I might be using it wrong, but yeah, yeah, I like the idea that I hate to use the same words again, but I just don't know how to explain it really, other than I feel like if all the elements are there, like in the potion <laughs> or something, and they're all true, pure feelings poured out, mm -hmm. that the combination of all of them, hopefully in a perfect world, could summon something that's more than I could imagine, and that I really believe in that, like in a way that's, I don't think I would try at all if I didn't feel like that's possible, and that almost I couldn't like, if I was, a, I'm just not a good enough artist to be able to make it be what I wanted it to be, but that is actually helpful in making the thing be what it needs to be. Or it's also a matter of realizing when it is becoming the thing it needs to be and then letting it go there. Like, I don't have such a concrete example except for with the PS1 piece, which I know you've seen flipping by. It was like, I had an idea of it and I made a model and I understood what I thought it was. And I understood like the three levels as being like to me as being like, re, like conscious living reality life. Then under that, um, uh, uh, like a place in between life and death and under that, which is actually the reflection of the white room on the top mm -hmm. as being like relief or vacation or death or something that's beyond that. Mm -hmm. But then when it came to actually working with the piece, it really seemed necessary that the piece was way lighter, like in terms of having daylight in it, than I thought it would be. And it seemed like it had to be light and it wasn't gonna be dark. 
and it just I didn't fight it I had to just go I just had to realize that that was how the piece was supposed to be right. and it was like a moment of I don't know I don't want to attach too many like it sounds I know it could sound like not true but it mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know I'm losing my train of thought sorry that's okay it's complicated yeah <laughs> but it's been so nice working with Catherine and Jed and everyone here, it's been really amazing. I mean, I didn't realize until last week that this isn't that common for everyone, to, or for anyone to be actually filling this place with junk and <laughs> like, and then moving all the junk over there and then bringing it over there. And like you saw like halfway through. <laughs> so there's been a lot of, we really did make it here. Um, and I, I don't think, I think I was trying to pretend like I was going to make it there and then bring it here. Right. And then, but everyone's been so great and it's been a pretty special experience for me to see when people care about each other so much because it's really, it is a real life, like, it's hard, it's not just a job, you know. It's like we're people with things going on and problems and stuff. Right. <laughs> and happy times. <laughs> happy times too, yeah. yes. But um, I think we may be nearing yeah. an end and a time for questions. Before, before I open the floor to questions, I've been asking you all these questions, and I just wanted to give you a chance if there's any questions you have for me in all this. It only seemed fair. Do you, you like can also. Me? <laughs> I don't yes. know. I can't really. Uh, I don't know. I'll probably. Okay. I'm like you a can, really one on one person. You can so. take a rain check on that. Okay. A rain check. For anything. Okay. A rain but, so to speak. A rain check. <laughs> Sorry. It's um, okay. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions, or maybe Catherine can too. But yeah, please. Are there, are there any questions? Um, we have um, um, folks with microphones. If you've got uh, questions, and they will, a microphone will come <laughs> to you. Oh. Being in the space and the platform and the banister, um, the railing, it reminded me when I described it to someone, it reminded me of being at an outlook over a national park or the ocean. <laughs> and um, so I, when you just mentioned that you were considering like being on a vacation, I thought that worked really well with how I perceived that entry to the, to the place. Oh, that's nice. Um... Yeah, my actual, I think there's another part of it that we didn't discuss very much, which is that I was, I had all these different models of mirrors going different directions before we settled on this pie shape. And part of it was I was trying to make an ocean that would be, or a water that would be endless to a horizon. And um, I think I just wasn't there yet in terms of figuring out that, because it's a lot of math and a lot of physical like construction problems that have to be solved and also not knowing like before I came here I really didn't know how everyone one here was so great because you're just far away and emailing and stuff and so I don't think I had the confidence to do those other plans at that time but but I was so when we were putting this together I was really worried that it would seem too much like a pool of water like a Shamu situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I've been happy that it seems, I mean, it's always a combination. You also see, it depends what you open your eyes to, because also if there's people all along the railing, you see them circling the entire piece, if you notice it. Um, so, but I guess to speak to that though, I also kind of like the way it ended up being a pool where it's kind of about being stuck because everything is sort of, you can't get out of that. And I think that that's sort of, I mean, probably maybe too much information, but I feel like it's, this has been a really hard project to make for some reason. And there has been a lot of stuckness in the process, just trying to figure out how physically to make something non-physical happen, you know? I don't know if that makes sense, but hope that helps. <laughs> um, anyone else? Other questions? Cindy? First, I want to say thank you so much for providing us 
with the most incredible installation. We're lucky to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you to Nasher for that. And especially Thank you, Nasher. <laughs> I have a question about the progression of your work. I've been a fan, as you know, for years. Mm -hmm. And um, a piece I'm thinking about doesn't have the different layers. And so my question for you, I think this piece from, I don't know how many years ago, um, it is a table turned on its side right, and Canada. attached to the wall, an yeah. unlikely way for what we call the tabernacle for <laughs> our <laughs> gatherings. Um, the food is on there. Some of it looks like what you would love to eat. Others have weird colors, so you're always coming back to it. And I, now that you've explained to us, um, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of you can relate to it because it looks real, but it could never be that way in reality. The food's not sliding off. No one has a table on the wall. And then the next thing I know, you are doing these very complicated installations in terms of our perception. You've provided the opportunity yet again, but in a much different way to explore what looks to be real, but then with the, what I love to describe as the slow reveal, you realize that it's not really that way. Well, so actually, how did you jump yeah. from kind of a simple form? I know, I wish I would have, somehow I managed to, I'm sorry, Sarah, <laughs> somehow we were rushing yesterday and the picture, the, the, that table is, it's, it's not exactly from, but it is from the thinking of the installation that I did at Canada Gallery in New York in 2000, what, I don't know, 16 or something, or I don't remember the date, but that piece, which it was, so it was a four wall gallery, sort of a box, and each wall was a different thought, is what I, how I thought of it, and um, so it was sort of similar as like a moving on from the mass murder show. And so there, there was one whole wall with tables that were like from a country restaurant. And then there was a mirror on the floor and there's a walkway that was raised above. So when you were in the middle of the room, you saw, you could see to each wall. And when you were looking at each wall, it looked like an aerial view of an area of a, of a place. So one was like, a banquet hall or like a reception hall or a, which is where the table, the ear piece was from, um, or like a wedding or any kind of place where there's an anticipatory um, kind of fanciness that's like a little, um, just you guys know what that is. And then one was a country restaurant with stained glass windows above and like, um, you know, checkered tables and carpet below and stuff. And then one was a hotel lobby um, and one was an apartment, a single person's apartment with a bed that was like bisected by the mirror so they became a double bed when it was a single bed. And then I think that's it. But so anyway, in my mind, I was trying to have it be like, again, I guess I thought of it as like a mind thinking and that you can never, like an overwhelmed mind thinking could only see one thought at a time, but they're all there and it's always confusing. So I was just like, that's how I like logically described what I was trying to do. But your table is just like, it's, I really, I don't know what to call it. I believe in the objects too. And it's been really hard to figure out a way 
for the objects to live by themselves. So what I did with that table and with a lot of them is I put more energy into them and tried to put some of those contradictions into the table itself. But it was originally on the wall and that's why it's still on the wall. But um, I don't know if that answers it enough. And I'm sorry we don't have a picture of it. It's just, I bet that's, you can see it. You'll, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll recognize this if you look. I don't know. Is that, maybe there's something to say more. Sarah is the person from Night, or from Canada Gallery, and she's right here. Is there something I'm missing? Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> Yeah, arrows, yeah. right. So Thanks. I forget my own language all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, I thought of every object that came out of that installation or some of my other ones as arrows that point back to the bigger picture because that was the only way that I felt comfortable with them going out there in pieces. But I also really like the fact that, like to me it's meaningful. You have one of those tables, someone else has one. Like someday in the future that the piece, the whole installation could come back into shape and be shown together with all the other installations. Like for me, that would be really spe like incredibly special and meaningful. So I love it that the parts are saved. Because as you can imagine, it's like nobody knows what's going to happen with this. And like I've been very lucky that the Whitney got the one there and they are protecting it. And this, the Guts one, which is this, ended up getting remade and like I redid it in slightly different way in Sydney at the, I don't know what the name, the new modern is pretty much the building there and that they then have it in their collection and they're saving it. So it's like, for me, it's just about protecting the, you know, the piece, which isn't easy for anybody. And I, it's, I have a lot of compassion because it's a storage problem, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, are there, um, are there any other questions? Or we can also say, oh, one more. We'll take one more then. If I understood correctly, you, you design and make the pieces of the installation in LA. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you ship it all here. Yeah. And then install it. So do you use 100% of what you made? Or do you <laughs> scrap parts? Or do you scramble and go out and get new things when you're here, all of that? All of it, like, all of it's that. funny because there's a, you know how the shape of the, um, is it still working? Okay. Yeah. The shape of the piece is literally constructed like a point on this side and this side, there's room in the room. So this whole side is chock full of all this stuff that didn't make it into the piece. Uh, <laughs> some of that is like, a physical problem because it just takes a long time to get everything up there. Some of it is just that it didn't feel like the right thing or didn't look the right way. And then some of it is like, I hate, I've always made my own vegetation in the past. Like when I did the show at Canada, I, like I made the lettuce that was in the lunch room or lunch buffet, like with fabric and stuff. But in this one, we did go to Michael's and we bought the foliage because because it just had to happen, I feel like, which I usually yeah. don't do. I usually don't use anything that's already mm -hmm. made. But, um, but it was also really fun and a huge relief to go there and see that they had pre-Halloween um, stuff and there was actually <laughs> like black leaves and stuff. And I was like, black leaves, this is amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. so, but yeah, and then when, just to clarify though, when I say I made everything, like I melted all that plastic by hand with a, um, with a heat gun. Mm -hmm. So that was like, I think 400 pieces of plastic. And then all the attachments are kind of handmade that go up to the ceiling with three claws and a mm -hmm. ferrule that's like hammered, um, which my dad actually helped me was, with in Michigan. I was gonna mention, yeah, yeah. Your, dad, your dad helped with various aspects of this yeah. project and we should he helped a lot in terms of just work, like working through how I'm going to build stuff and what's possible and testing. Like I spent a really long time trying to test how the plastics can move in a fan to make them look like a, a current or like, and you know, it's like working in some areas and then I, you know, it's like, I'm not a 
I don't know what kind of person would have that job, but <laughs> so th all that stuff came as individual parts and had to be put together. And the art handlers here, like I think, you know, it's not really a normal art handler job to make, like to put all the attachments into the water. And then we all hung the water and it was a lot of parts and they were all, all over the place. <laughs> We, we also bought some additional paint here and you also yeah. did some painting. Oh yeah, I repainted the figures here. A couple, or I repainted a bunch of stuff <clears throat> and I ruined some stuff and I tried cutting apart a dolphin because I was trying to put it on the mirror. And There's like a lot of ideas, which always happens for me, a lot of ideas that can't be realized in this piece for one reason or another that, like actually in the Canada piece, I was trying to make a dolphin for that piece. Just, there was so much going on in that. I'm so sorry we don't have a picture. But, um, so that dolphin kind of, that dolphin is not even really in this piece. It's probably just another piece in the future. Exactly, I don't know. It'll, the, the dolphin is to be continued. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, I'm um, hot. That's, <laughs> I think that, uh, I, I should also say, um, Sarah, I made the PowerPoint this morning. And yeah. so, no, I, I wish, no, I wish we had so included, rushed. I wish we had included, because that's a really interesting, that's it a really is. interesting piece as well. And it's important. Yes. It was my yeah. fault. I didn't give her the nah. picture. Anyway. Not, okay. It's <laughs> go out there, if you haven't, and spend some time. Um, and if, let us know if you have an answer. If there, I don't think there is an answer to, if, the, if Earth is the brain, then where is the body? <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I want to thank you. Yeah. Can I thank you guys? What's I just wanted to thank these guys, everyone here, which they know who they are, and I'm, <laughs> you know, you two, and just everyone who helped on the project and the amazing people that actually make it happen in the background, which I don't think really get that much credit, like Bosco and yeah. Luis and stuff. And um, I know they're not here to hear it, but it really matters to me a lot. Mm -hmm. it, and it's mm -hmm. been just great. Like, I really mm -hmm. feel like the loving nature of this place has been a huge yeah. um, inspiration for yeah. me. We can, we can shout out um, definitely um, I'll tell Luis you. and Christopher Bosco, who okay. hopefully are enjoying uh, a day off. A day, a day <laughs> off, exactly. Yeah. Uh, who have been troubleshooting things all week, and especially. And lights and great fans attitude. and electric and yeah. And never uh, always like happy yeah. to just keep yeah. on making it. And they changed their plans lots of times because like I wanted to work in there to do the lighting when they needed to do the handrail, you know, and they had to stay late. And it's actually really, um, it's those little things that are, it's a really big deal. And it's not easy to do all those jobs. And I'm not good at half of it because I'm too short. <laughs> like, um, and there are a lot of things that art handlers also were amazing and they, you know, anyway, I don't want to okay. wob on, but or whatever. Or don't take that out, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Thanks Thank everyone. you very much for being here. <laughs>